Amen. Thank you. Welcome. How many of you know a life made right by God is a life that is a blessing everywhere you go? That's what I'm sharing on is God's righteousness and how we're made right by God. The only way a man or a woman can be made right or righteous with God is by God. And the way that happens is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And really excited about the word today and the things on my heart. And I'm just praying for you to open your heart and that God would open your eyes and, and just be, be a blessing to you today. I think this is powerful what, what's on my heart. I appreciate the worship service today. Let's give the worship team a, a hand. God bless you for your hard work and just your ministry to the Lord. I really believe the Holy Spirit did speak and that things are happening supernaturally by the glory of God in people's lives. And so I'm excited about the Spirit and the Word. Well, let's talk about self-righteousness because self-righteousness is a deadly sin. It was the sin that the Pharisees committed that literally kept them out of the kingdom of God. So for a Pharisee, their self-righteousness again was was deadly. I have discovered though that even after people get saved, they'll put their faith in the grace of God to be forgiven of their sins, but there's this subtle movement from grace that takes place where they wind up coming under the works of the law to be delivered or the works of the law or their ability to keep some holy righteous standard to earn something from God. And that will hinder the blessings of God in your life. And so we need, to, we need to be aware of what is this thing that is called self-righteousness in the Bible and how do I keep it out of my heart? Because God doesn't want any of us operating in self-righteousness, our own righteousness. He wants us operating in his kind of righteousness that comes by grace through faith. So let's dive into this in Romans chapter 9 verses 30 through 33. Paul makes some profound statements about Israel and not being made righteous because of their misunderstanding of the law and how that the Gentiles were made righteous before God by this thing called grace through faith. The verses before are real important. He talks about how Israel had always had a seed among them, the promised seed. And because of the promised seed, they were made holy in the eyes of God. They were a blessing because of the, the promised seed, not the seeds, plural. It wasn't the blood of Abraham in their veins that made them righteous and made them special in the world. It was the faith of Abraham in their hearts that made them blessed and a blessing to the world. And so he says that God has always saved Israel, always saved his people through this remnant. And then he makes a statement. He said, had it not been for this promised seed, the faith children, Israel would have been no better than Sodom and Gomorrah. Now that is a strong statement and that was offensive to people. And one of the reasons I really believe Paul was so hated and persecuted and even prosecuted by the Romans, hated and persecuted by the Jews, is because this guy said some things that offended people. Okay. He talked about God's love and universal love for everyone, and that was offensive to a religious person. He talked about how God wants everybody saved. That was offensive to a religious person. He talked about how people are being healed, people are being saved, people are being blessed through grace, through faith, not their own personal holiness. And someone who has a religious mind takes offense of that, so he deals with it. He says, what shall we say then concerning this remnant concerning how people were made right with God. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. What are we going to say here? The Gentiles that didn't even want the law, know the law, pursue the law, pursue holiness, they were made righteous. How were they made righteous? By faith. Then he says, but Israel... Pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Then he says, why? 
Why did Israel that had the law, was trying to keep the law, why were they not made righteous? And why were the Gentiles made righteous who didn't have the law, pursue the law, or even care about the law? That's a good question. Why? Because they did not seek it by what? Faith. Faith. But as it were, by the works of the law. The reason the Jew wasn't made righteous in the eyes of God is they were looking to their own righteousness. They were looking to their works of the law to be made right. The reason the Gentiles were made right is they knew they didn't have anything to look to. They didn't have anything to present to God, so they called out on the mercy of God and were made righteous by faith. He says, for they, that's talking about the Jews, They stumbled at the stumbling stone. Now, what is this talking about? As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of what? Offense. And whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. What was this rock of offense? It was the grace of God. It was the kindness of God for everyone. It was the love of God for all people and that... God loves you not based on your performance. God loves you based on his character. God's not going to save you based on what you do or quit doing. He's going to save you based on his grace and you trusting him. That's offensive to a religious person because a religious person thinks they're earning favor with God. They think they deserve to be saved. They think they're better than a quote unquote sinner so God owes them and as the Pharisees did if you take this to its full conclusion it'll cost you the kingdom of heaven I don't believe anybody within the sound of my voice is doing that but I believe many good Christians will come to Jesus they'll realize I can't do enough to get saved or save myself I can't quit enough can't start enough or stop enough so I call out on the mercy of God and I'm saved by grace through faith but what happens is you subtly get pulled over back into I know I'm saved by grace but if I'm going to get healed I got to do this 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 I got to quit this quit this don't eat that start eating this go here don't go there and you don't realize you're coming to God and saying God I have done this and this will you heal me now that silence you hear is called mercy because if you got what you deserved you'd go straight to hell do not pass go or collect two hundred dollars none of us are getting what we deserve Amen or oh me. See, now I've already nailed half of you evidently because we don't realize self-righteousness creeps into our heart when we're looking to ourself, when we're looking to our performance to get God to do something. When we leverage our holiness or leverage our good works to get God to move, we're saying, God, you owe me. And God doesn't owe us anything. Everything we get from God is a gift, not a debt. And that's what self-righteousness does. And it hinders the grace of God in your life. It hinders the flow of God's power in your life. It hinders all the blessings of God because as soon as you turn to works, you just rejected grace. Amen. As soon as you point to yourself, you just neglected Jesus. And so you have to learn to stand now in the righteousness you've been made by faith, not your own righteousness. So chapter 10 He goes into chapter 10 after those comments, and I covered this in our last session. I'm just going to quote it. He says, man, I bear record that Israel, you know, I bear record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And my heart's desire is that they might be saved, that they would be saved. They have a, a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And then he says, for they being ignorant of God's knowledge, God's righteousness... They're going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, he says, because Christ now is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ is not the end of the law of Moses. There are things we learn out of the law. There's things we glean out of the law. There's principles and stories and people and their experience with God. We also have the law and a purpose of the law under the New Testament that I'll get into later that'll help you balance all this out. But he said, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. What does that mean? Christ is the end of me looking to my performance to be made right with God. Christ is the end of me looking to rules, regulations, rituals, to go to God and say, I've done this, this, and this. I kept that 
commandment. I kept this commandment. You owe me. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. I don't appeal to my holiness in the presence of God ever. I don't bring up my name in the presence of God or my works or my performance. When I come to God, I come to God in the name of the holy child Jesus and I bring up who Jesus is and what Jesus did and I got saved because of faith in Jesus. I'm getting healed because of faith in Jesus. I'm seeing miracles because of faith in Jesus. I'm blessed because of faith in Jesus. You better start. I'll preach all day long on this if you don't respond. I'm being used now by God's amazing grace in my life through faith. I'm not saying I don't live a holy life. We'll get into all that. I'm not saying there's not a place for holiness or good works in our life. There is, but not before God. And not to be made right with God, not to be delivered from anything, not to be healed of anything, and not to be blessed by God. That self-righteousness when you go to God and you bring up you and what you've done to get him now to move in your life. And you need to be aware of that. And one of the reasons we've got to deal with condemnation later is because all of us deal with these things. And you either ignore them or deny them and become blinded by your self-righteousness. Or a lot of times the Holy Spirit will bring something to your attention and you'll self-destruct. You'll feel condemned. You'll feel bad. You'll feel embarrassed. That how could I act like that or think like that? It's because without God, that's the way you are. Amen or oh me. And so you learn to repent of it. You learn to, to reject any self-righteousness in your life and get established in God's kind of righteousness, okay? And that's where we're headed. So they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They tried to establish their own righteousness and they wouldn't submit to the righteousness of God. Write down Romans chapter 11. That's the next chapter. He talks about a remnant and he talks about how there is the election of grace. And you talk about creating issues, the word election throws so many Christians into confusion. The word predestination throws Christians into confusion. The word foreknowledge, God whom he foreknow, them also he did predestinate, that confuses people. I don't want to touch on all of that, but it's so simple. We've just made it hard, and I'm not sure why or how, but the bottom line is Romans chapter 11 talks about the election of grace and that the people God has chosen to save are those who believe in him, those who believe in grace. The people God rejects, he didn't foreordain and want or create them to be rejected. He created them to respond to his grace through faith, but they chose to look to their own righteousness and you cannot be saved by your own works. And so this election of grace, he puts it in the context of Elijah and, and Elijah got discouraged and he thought Israel has become so ungodly. They're worshiping Baal. They're offering their children on, on altars, killing their own kids. You can't get any more dark and evil than that. And Elijah, a prophet, is so discouraged, he thinks he's the only one serving God. And God says, wait a minute, I've got 7,000 men that have not bowed their knee to evil, not bowed their knee to darkness, but is a part of the remnant. And God has always had a remnant in this earth. He had a remnant before the law. He had a remnant under the law. And he still has a remnant under grace. Hallelujah. God is going to get this thing ultimately turned around in this world. And the kingdom of God will one day be manifest where there's nothing but righteousness in it. Amen. I'm so excited about the remnant, the remnant, the remnant. So he talks about this remnant. And then in verse 6 says... Because we're saved by grace, we're healed by grace, we're blessed by grace, we're a good godly people by grace through faith. He says, and if by grace, verse 6, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If it's grace, you can't mix works, the works of the law with it, or you cancel grace out. Then he reverses it. He says, but if it's of works, if you're saved by your works, your performance, your holiness, your conduct... If you're healed by all of that, blessed by all of that, he says, if it's by works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Man, that's pretty powerful. All he's saying is you can't mix your holiness with God's holiness and win. <laughs> Amen. They cancel one another out. Either you're going to stand on your own works and get a big zero with the circle knocked off, or you're going to stand by grace and have the whole kingdom of God as a gift given to you. Amen. Amen. 
And that is something that's a process that we're growing in our understanding as we go forward in God. Now, Philippians 3, 9 is the verse, and I wish I hadn't put the verse up. I, I didn't do good on this, my bad. But verse 9, please look at me for, for right now and leave the screen alone because verses 4 through 8, it'd take too long to read it all. But you need to read that in, in your life group or your, your talk it out groups or whatever you're a part of as you discuss the messages and what God's doing. You need to understand Paul opens this chapter up with, if anybody has a right to boast in their holiness, boast in their flesh, it would be me. And he begins to list just a few of the things that are a part of what he used to call holiness after his flesh. And they're huge. And then he makes a profound statement in verse 9. In verse 4, he talks and starts out with, Look, man, I was circumcised the eighth day. I know Jewish ritual. I've been a part of the Hebrew culture, and I was circumcised the eighth day. He says, Man, you talk about Jewish blood. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I know my roots. I have, I have traced my roots, and I'm a part of one of the 12 tribes documented. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. And then he makes a profound statement that makes me very nervous to even preach, to say out loud. I think I know what he was doing and saying, but I just cringe. At times, I've literally almost lost my breath saying what I'm about to say because of the weight of it. He says, concerning the law, I was blameless. If you would have come to me and tried to convict me of sin by the Mosaic law, you would have found no flaw in me. I kept that law to a T. I was blameless. Then he turns right around and says, and oh, by the way, I persecuted the church of God. I had holiness outwardly, but my heart was dark and evil. I stirred up a mob to stone Stephen, to kill a man. I prosecuted and persecuted Christians and drug them out of their homes and beat them in the synagogues. Here's a man that's got all this holiness, all this self-righteousness, according to the law, could have been seen as blameless, yet he had a dark, evil heart. Let me tell you what religion, vain religion, religion without God, pure religion has to have God involved in it and deals with widows and the fatherless and defending the, the weak among us. But religion without God, religion without God is evil. It's dark. It has an outward show of holiness with a dark, evil heart. God's righteousness, God's holiness comes by God's grace through faith. The minute you call upon Jesus and he changes your dark heart to a heart of light. He puts his Holy Spirit and sheds abroad in your heart the Holy Spirit. And now God's kind of holiness starts in here with you and works its way out by the grace of God through your faith. This man was holy after the flesh. But in his heart was not a good man, not a godly man. He said, I don't want to be found in that stuff. Look at what he said. I want to be found in him. I want to be found in Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the what? Now, what is hard about that? Why can't religious people see this? I don't want to get frustrated. I don't want to upset you or offend you. But what doesn't click when we read that? Look at it again. I don't want to be found or I want to be found in him. That's Jesus. Not having my own righteousness, which is from what? When you appeal to the law to be made righteous, that's your own righteousness. It's self-righteousness. And I don't know what's so hard even reading it. I even put it in yellow for you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's not hard. And yet religious people struggle with this. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God. See, there's righteousness that comes from God. It's his very righteousness by faith. And then there's your own righteousness that comes from you trying to perform or measure up to please God in and of yourself. And you can't after the flesh. He says the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable even unto his death. Man, that is so heavy. That is so profound. If you really want to know God, you can't even begin to know his heart, his nature, his character, and be conformed into that image till you understand how to be made right with him by grace through faith. 
That's why this is so important. Not just to get people saved, but after you get saved, don't slip over into self-righteousness. And yet people ignore it or they self-destruct when they do see it in their life. We don't need to do either. We need to repent. We need to repent. All right. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, this is a Pharisee and a tax collector praying. And I'm going to show you symptoms of self-righteousness. And I'm only going to show you four, okay? Because I believe these four will get us all, okay? Okay, I'll give you ten. We could go to 20, but I don't want to hurt your feelings too bad. I don't want to offend you. I don't want you jumping up mad because I called you self-righteous. Because, again, it offends religious people. And you've you got to learn in church, too, to be cool when something really hits you. How many of you know that if there's a pack of dogs running across your yard and you throw a rock, the one that yelps got hit? You didn't get it. Okay, just be cool. Don't get up mad. I remember one time I was talking about adultery and a man jumped up mad, screaming at me, running out of the church. Wow, that's not bright. I didn't know he ha was having an affair. I didn't call his name. I wasn't talking about him. He could have sat there and been cool and nobody would have knew. Okay? So be cool on this. I'm going to read this and show you four symptoms, and we're going to deal with it in our hearts. He also spoke this parable to some who trusted in who? See, when you, when you are in self-righteousness, you're trusting yourself. God, I've read my Bible every day. I've got 45 days of a streak on you version going. I've been through next steps. Why haven't you healed me yet? Why haven't you blessed me yet? Why didn't you answer my prayer, God? You were trusting in yourself. That's real good. I ain't even got to the hard stuff yet. And it offends people when you bring it to their attention. Especially when they see somebody they know that isn't right. They're not living godly. And God does a miracle in their life. It's like, why did God heal them? I've been praying and fasting. I've been tithing. I've been... See, you think God's going to heal you based on your performance. The guy that got healed knows his performance stinks, so he didn't put any trust in it. He called out for God's mercy and got healed. Amen. Amen. Somebody joins the church. I'm going to nail you because you're not responding really well yet. <laughs> There'll be somebody new come to the church, and somebody in the church will buy him a car. And you will be upset that I've been coming to church down there for 10 years, and those people have seen me walk five of those years. The five years I had a car, they had to call the record to come pick it up every other week. Why hadn't God got me a new car? God got them a new car, and I'm holier than them. I've been in church. I've... That's self-righteousness, and you're canceling out the grace of God. The new guy that came to the church just thought, man, this is the greatest thing in the world. I've not measured up. I'm no good, and I know I'm no good. So God, would you have mercy on me? I need a car. Bam, they get a car. That'll offend a religious person. Because it's grace, it's mercy, it's God's goodness. So he spoke this parable and he talked about people who trust in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Uh-oh, when you get in self-righteousness, you begin to despise other people. And that's a symptom of self-righteousness. Here's where it gets really good. Two men went up to the temple to pray, a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. You got it. That's good. When you're in self-righteousness, you might as well just talk to yourself and listen to yourself because God's not in it. Amen. He's praying to himself. God, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I mean, that just makes my skin crawl. I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Look at this. Or even this tax collector. Can you imagine how wrong that really is? That you're standing in the presence of God, boasting in your holiness, your goodness, and while you're doing it, you're despising someone and judging and criticizing someone standing right next to you praying. That's how deceptive self-righteousness can be in your life. 
And I don't want any of that leaven in my heart. The leaven of the Pharisees. I don't want it in your heart. I certainly don't want it in our church. By the grace of God. He goes to now boasting in himself. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I am the cat's meow. I am the best thing since sliced bread. I am as pure as the wind driven snow. That's not in there but I've heard that stuff too. He goes on to say that the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you this man went down to his house justified, made righteous in the eyes of God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure you mean it. But I appreciate it so much, and we've got to work it out. We've got to walk it out if we're going to be the disciples of Jesus here. Because this stuff creeps into people's heart, and it, it cancels, it hinders the blessings of God in our lives, and, and being a blessing to other people. I, I actually had a friend share a story with me about how that he took one of his relatives to a church, not our church, but to another church, and and and. As his relative reached his hand out to shake the preacher's hand, he had a tattoo on his wrist. And it wasn't a godly tattoo. And here's why this is so hard on religious people. There'll be people sat right here and they'll think, I'm condoning tattoos or I'm condoning evil tattoos. I'm not doing any such thing. But as that man reached his hand to shake the preacher's hand and the preacher saw the tattoo, the preacher withdrew his hand. Wouldn't shake the man's hand. That is, that, that's not a good picture. That is not right. That is not a good thing, saints. To think that we would think that somehow or another, because we don't have a tattoo, we're better than someone who has a tattoo, that is self-righteousness. That is wrong. That is very, very wrong. And yet I could give you example of example, and if I talked long enough, I would nail every one of us in time. With somehow or some way, we thought we were better than somebody else. And we criticized other people. That's a form of self-righteousness. Racism is a difficult thing to talk about. And I wish we could talk about it more without it, without it being so perverted in our culture. And such a hot button. But the simplicity of racism is self-righteousness. How could anybody think they're better than somebody else because of the color of their skin? That's self-righteousness. I could point out so many cultural things that are filled with self-righteousness, but I can't help those people. I can only help the sheep. I can only help those that are seeking God and make sure we're the remnant and of the election of grace and that we look at people the way God looks at people. And while we don't condone sin and we don't condone evil tattoos on people's bodies, we don't condemn people either because except for the grace of God, we would be that and worse. I don't care who you're criticizing and judging and thinking you're better than. If you didn't have God's grace in your life, if you didn't have the presence of God in your life, you would be just as bad as they are and in most cases worse. That's a humble person that understands righteousness by faith. I'm not made righteous by my works. I'm made righteous by grace. God's not holding their unrighteousness against them either. And they can be made righteous with the very righteousness of God if they'll call out on the name of Jesus. Amen? And yet this isn't in people's hearts. So here's the symptoms. Number one, you despise others. You despise others. Anytime you feel that, don't get condemned and don't self-destruct and don't think you're an evil person. Deal with it. One of the reasons I want to spend a few hours on, on dealing with condemnation is the reason we all have to understand we're delivered from condemnation is so that God can help us. And when he shows us something like this, we don't feel condemned and, and just quit now and give up and think we're bad people. No, if God shows you, look, you're despising that person and that's self-righteous, just repent. Amen. And so that's a symptom. Despising other groups. Thinking you're better than other people, better than other groups. You remember Paul said that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews? That is one of my favorite statements in the Bible. Because it's like he's, he's setting himself up in his self-holiness, self-righteousness. He's saying, I wasn't just a Hebrew. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's like saying, I'm not a Baptist. I'm a Southern Baptist. 
I mean, Baptists are good, and God loves them, and, and, and if they've called upon Jesus, they're saved. But, but they're so low, they can literally still feel the flames of hell. A Southern Baptist can hear the angels of heaven. It's like the group, the group that I grew up in was Pentecostal. And, and, and they would go, we're Pentecostal. And there would be always someone that was better and would up you and go, I'm not Pentecostal. I'm Pentecostal holiness. <laughs> and literally despising other groups. That is self-righteousness. And it's paralyzing the blessing of God, not only in the church, but in the world today. And we got to be willing to deal with it. Can't be judging everybody else for it. we got to look for the Pharisee in our own hearts and any leaven of the Pharisee and not despise anybody. Look at this. I'm not like other men. I'm not like that harlot. I'm not like that drug addict. I'm not like that self-righteousness. And yet the Bible says in Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12, they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. It is never wise to compare yourself with somebody else and yet people do it all the time. Again, churches, we're better than that church. The world reeks with self-righteousness. Well, I'm better than them Democrats. Well, that ain't saying much. Well, I'm better than the Republicans. Well, I'm better than them hypocrites that go down to that church. Yep, yep, yep. I used to fall into a little bit of that. And I, and I asked God, look, I don't like this. This isn't right. How do, I, how do I stop it? Boy, this was a word from God. This will change your life, dear ones, if you'll open your heart. The Lord said, okay, if you want to compare yourself, Dwayne, compare yourself to me. How many of you know you may be the most righteous, holy person outwardly in this room, but when you put your righteousness up against Jesus's, you are found wanting every time. So instead of me comparing myself with a Christian over here that I look better than they do and I'm doing better than they're doing, if I'm going to compare, compare where I'm at with Jesus and man, that'll humble you fast because you'll always be falling short in the presence of Jesus compared to his holiness, his righteousness, Versus any righteousness of your, of your own. So you got to quit comparing yourself among yourselves. I'm not like other people. And then he was self-centered and self-absorbed. I, I. Anytime you hear yourself in prayer saying, God, I've done this and this and this. Why won't you answer my prayer? Why won't you? Stop and go, I was in an ignorant flash. I repent. There is nothing I can do to get you to do anything. You've done everything in Jesus by grace, and it's a gift, and I'm going to receive it by faith. Hallelujah. You'll start seeing prayers answered. You'll start seeing healings. You'll start seeing miracles in your life. And then he exalted himself, and those who exalt themselves get abased, and those who humble themselves get exalted. Listen, to humble yourself is to submit to the righteousness of God. It takes humility to submit to God's righteousness. Pride says, I am better than other people. I have done enough. I deserve this from God. I've earned this from God. That is pride on steroids. And yet so many Christians do that. It it takes humility to go, God, I am not righteous without you. I am not good without you. I am nothing without you. Thank you that I'm not without you. But because of you and your grace, you made me the very righteousness of God. So I'm going to pray today in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Dwayne. And I'm going to get my prayer answered in the name of Jesus, according to who he is and what he did, not the name of Dwayne, because I, without God, am a big zero with the circle knocked off. And that's who you are without God, without God. And that takes humility, and religious people can't do it. All right, John chapter 9, we're going to look at the blind man here that Jesus healed. I want to set this up. For years, I took verses 1 through 5, the blind man that Jesus healed, and I taught healing on it. And that was good, and it was okay. Then, for years, I would teach the verses I'm going to look at at the end of chapter 9, and I would teach those as it relates to righteousness by faith. And what the Lord has done in my heart and shown me, and this is a real revelation for me, I knew the context was both physical blindness and spiritual blindness, but I didn't teach them together. Today, I'm going to teach them together, and I just pray you open your heart. This is huge. And I'll just go ahead and say that I know some people aren't going to get it. That's okay. If you're a new believer, this is going to make your brain just scramble a little bit. If you've got a little bit of the Pharisee in you, it's going to scramble your brain. I wasn't going to bring this up because of the young people in this service, but how many of you remember pinball machines? 
Yeah, only, only a, an eighth of you. Uh, those were machines that we used to play these games. And if you, if you cheated, if you tried to pull the machine or bump the machine to get the ball to do what you want it to do, it would go tilt, tilt, tilt. Well, a lot of times when I'm reading scripture, my brain goes tilt, tilt, tilt. <laughs> and I got to unscramble it. And for a while, man, what Jesus said here is difficult. But once you see it, it's so simple. So if you don't see it today, please hang on to it. God wants to show you this. I believe it with all my heart. So it opens up with a blind man, and he's born blind. It's physical blindness. He is born blind. All right? He's a full-grown adult, and the disciples now come to Jesus, and they say, whose sin caused this man to be born blind? Was it the man or his parents? Now, buddy, I really struggle with that. The second one, I can kind of see their thinking, but the first one, how can you think a baby could sin in its mother's womb and the sin be such that it would create blindness? That's just dumb. That's just really slow. And so they're saying, did the baby sin or was it the parents? Jesus just fires right back and he says, neither the child nor the parents, but that the works of God might be revealed in him. I must work the works of God while it is st still day. Night is going to come and these works will not be worked because he was the light of the world. So he wasn't saying like religion teaches, God made the man blind so Jesus could now heal him. And he didn't say sin didn't create the blindness. He said it wasn't the baby's sin or the parent's sin. But if you read the Bible, you know it was Adam's sin. That Adam sold the human race out in high treason to Satan and sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, sickness entered the world and death entered the world. So it wasn't their personal sin, even though later I'll deal with personal sins can create issues for you in seed time and harvest. It was the sin of Adam. And it's still the sin of Adam and sin in the world that's ca causing all these diseases and causing all these handicaps and on and on it go. And Jesus made it clear, I must work the works of God. The work of God was to heal his blindness. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus said, the Holy Ghost has come upon me and one of the primary reasons I'm here is to bring sight to the blind. So he heals the guy. All right, and this is pretty powerful. He takes some clay, he spits in the clay, puts it on the guy's eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he came back healed. He came back seeing, and he's so excited about this, and you would be too, that word got back to the Pharisees, and watch what religious minds twisted by demonic forces do to people. They were upset that the guy got healed because it was Saturday. I mean, it's just so stupid that if there was a day to get healed, it would be on the Sabbath. And yet they're mad. So they start interrogating the guy. Who healed you? Well, I don't, I don't know really who healed me. Well, how did he do it? Well, I'm not really sure, but I put some clay. He took some clay. He spit in it. I really didn't like that, but I didn't have anything to lose. So I put it on my eyes. I went and washed in the pool of uh, Siloam, and I came back seeing. They got so upset that they brought the guy's parents in and interrogated them. And they tried to doubt whether this was really the blind guy. They asked the parents, is this your son? Yeah. Was he blind and born blind? Yeah. Do you know who healed him? No. They lied. They knew if they said it was Jesus, they'd be kicked out of church. And so they said, I love what they said. They said, well, hey, he's a full age. Ask him. <laughs> Then they ask him again, and they said, well, we don't know. He's a full age. Ask him. Threw their own son under the bus, amen, <laughs> so that they wouldn't be kicked out of church. And so now they are so frustrated, the Pharisees, they kicked the guy out of church anyway. Jesus hears about it, so he finds the guy and says, hey, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe in the Lord? And the man said, well, who is the Lord? And Jesus said, you're looking at him and talking to him. Even a Pharisee ought to be able to get that, but they didn't get it. And the man went, well, I believe. And so it was so exciting. Then all of a sudden now, it, sh it shifts in the story from physical blindness and God opening eyes to spiritual blindness. And watch how the Pharisees caught it. Look at verse 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world that those who do not see, that's blind, right? That's the easy part, right? 
that was not good enough. For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see, that's blind people, right? May see. And that those who see may be made blind. He can't be talking about physical blindness because Jesus never physically made anybody blind. But he healed everybody that asked that was physically blind. He made them see. So that can't be talking about now physical blindness. He said, I came into this world to cause people that are blind to see and to blind people that see. And look at the Pharisees' response. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? This is one of the reasons the scriptures are good and you need to read them. I love the Bible, but you still need the spirit behind it. Because I'm telling you, they didn't just say, are we blind also? That's not how this came down. It's kind of like emails. I quit reading all my negative emails because I discovered it took me years that people that are filled with hate and criticism don't really want help and you can't help them anyway. So I quit reading them and it was so hard to read the tone. It was so hard to read the spirit behind an email. Same way with Facebook, Twitter, all these social medias. While there is a positive leverage I believe God can use, these things can be negative in your life, not being able to communicate properly. And that's how this was. They did not look at Jesus with a good heart and say, hey, are we blind also? Are you saying, hey, help me out here, Jesus. Man, I, if I'm blind, please tell me. Am I blind? That's not how they said it. They were snarky. They were condescending and self-righteous. And they said, are we blind also? <laughs> Snakes and vipers is what they were. And they jumped all over. Are we blind also? They knew exactly what he was saying. And look at what Jesus said. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say you see. We see. Therefore your sins remain. That is so simple but yet so profound. In our daily, our daily walk with God. He said, you kidding me? I'm not saying you guys are blind. If you guys were blind, you could be forgiven of your sins. You could have your sins removed. But because you say we see your sins remain. And I think Jesus did an awesome job because I would have laughed at him. I'd have said, are you kidding me? I'm not accusing you people of being blind. If you were blind, you could be forgiven. If you were blind, you could be saved. If you were blind, you could have all your sins removed. But you are going to split a devil's hell wide open because of your self-righteousness. You say, I am right with God. You say, I have need of nothing. You say, you are holy. You say, you are good. And your sin remains. Do you realize, dear ones, the first step to being born again, to being made right with God, is to admit you're wrong? And if you can't admit you're wrong, you can never be made right. And if you think you're right when you're wrong, you die wrong. Thank God every one of us were blind. And thank God we had enough humility one day to wake up and say, I am blind. I don't understand the kingdom. I can't see the kingdom. I agree with you, Jesus. I must be born again. Because if I'm not born again, Jesus said in John 3, 3, I cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, without God, I'm blinded to what good really is. I'm blinded to what holy really is. I'm blinded to what righteousness really is. But when I see, I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I am not perfect. I am not good in and of myself. I am not holy. There's no good thing in me now because I admit I'm blind. All my sin is removed. And now I can see the true and the living God and his true nature in Jesus. Amen. Amen. The first step to being made right is to see you're wrong. And if you can't see you're wrong, but say you're right when you're wrong, you stay wrong. And that's what Jesus was saying is, no, you guys aren't blind. You guys say you see. You say you're righteous. You say you're holy. You say you're better than other people. You say you're better than other groups. And so your sin remains because you say you see. But when you see that that man at the beginning of the chapter, watch this. That man was born into sin blind because of another man's sins, Adam's.
Once you see that we've all been born into this life spiritually blind and that we cannot see God, we cannot know good, we cannot discern good. I'm telling you, God has purged primarily out of the church most Pharisees. The Pharisees today are in Washington, D.C. These people think they are righteous and holy and better than God, better than the church, better than the Bible. The national media reeks with self-righteousness, condescending on those that don't think like they think or act like they think or vote like they vote and they despise anybody that doesn't look like them, talk like them, think like them or vote like them. That is self-righteousness on steroids and yet I can't help them but I can help a Christian that can admit they're blind do you realize the day you say I know everything you become a colossal jewel of ignorance the day you say I know everything I see all knowledge you remain in your ignorance the beginning of wisdom and understanding is to say I don't know what good and evil is without God without God you corrupt good and you corrupt evil without God in his righteousness and faith in Jesus you will pass laws that will protect the right of a woman and legally now kill a baby outside of the womb and stand up and clap and call that righteous and holy I believe in the rights of women but it can only be achieved by the tree of life and eating of the tree of life that women find true equality and that they find their true rights but when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil self-righteousness I don't need God now you call good evil and evil good I'm here to tell you I'm going to be in the crowd that says I need God and I'm going to call what God calls good and what God calls evil and I'm going to eat of the tree of life, righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And yet we got an entire culture reeking with self-righteousness that they're smarter than God, they're holier than God, they're wiser than God. And the truth is we're all blind. We're all blind. We all need God. And you'll need God the rest of your life to maintain your sanity in this dark world, saints. And I just pray that I've made some sense here. Because that's a tough saying. Are we blind? Nah. If you guys were blind, your sin would be removed. But because you say, I see, your sin remains. Man, I thank God for that day when I humbled myself and said, you know what? I can't do enough to get right with God. I can't quit enough to, to get right with God. I can't start enough. I can't stop enough. I need your mercy, God. Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I'm no good. Without you, without you, I'm blind. And now I'm no longer without him because I was able to humble myself and not look to me, but look to Jesus. I'm seeing the power of God in my life. I'm seeing the blessings of God in my life. I'm seeing the goodness of God on my family and on our church and I'm going just a little bit over because this is so huge. I made a joke the last service. It got so quiet. I just said, honey, are you getting this? And everybody cracked up laughing. Sue's got to get this. Amen. Do you know self-righteousness is destroying more marriages? Do you realize every time I have had to deal with somebody over a divorce or getting a divorce, self-righteousness was right in the middle of it. I'm better than her. I'm doing what's right. I'm not doing anything wrong. We should all put you up here on the stage. I mean, can you imagine saying that? I mean, I, I, I can't wait to get to holiness because I live a holy life and I believe in living a holy life and I really believe I'm as holy as anybody in this room. Maybe, probably better. Now, some of you get nervous. You're just spoiling the whole message now. That was pretty arrogant. You didn't hear the end. I don't care if I'm holier than everybody in this room. I'm not perfect after the flesh and I need God every day of my life. And if Sue and I are having a problem in our marriage, I'm not going to be condescending and self-righteous. I'm going to humble myself and say, help me with what's wrong with me. Because usually with Sue and I, she's 90% wrong. <laughs> but what about my 10%? Well, y'all just aren't appreciating this. Did anybody get anything besides offended? Amen. Amen. This is huge. Go over it and over it and over it and start to work it by the grace of God into your life. Don't ever look to yourself. 
and your holiness to leverage God. Look to Jesus, the author now and finisher of your faith. Amen. Father, I love these people so much. Thank you for our relationships. When we see righteousness by faith, we're not arrogant, we're humble. When we see righteousness by faith, we're a merciful people. We're a kind people. We're benevolent. It's easy to forgive. All the things that we're trying to get people to do, they just come out of a revelation of righteousness by faith. And so help me to communicate, Jesus. Help me to download this. I have such a passion for it because I know the benefits of it. I know the power of it in everyday battles. And so thank you for delivering us from all self-righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.